Hello, everyone, and thank you for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, my name is Kristen Hernandez, and this is Lester Velasquez Poe that will be presenting today. And we will be going over the third and final installment of the Santa Fe Expedition, The End of the Journey. I love these titles. They're very dramatic as the journey was itself. Um, but we work, we what we both work at Casa Navarro State Historic Site. Um, we are the we are located in downtown San Antonio and we are the home site of Jose Antonio Navarro. Um, so Lester, if you'd like to just hop in. Sure. Thank you. Thank you everyone so much for joining. Uh, so this is the last part, as Kristen said. Um, just a super quick recap, uh, the uh, Santa Fe expedition traveled north from Austin uh, in June of 1841 towards Santa Fe. There was already a trading route uh, from Independence, Missouri, since about 20 years before. So it's kind of a strange uh, route to, to plan because, uh, you know, they could have traded directly with Chihuahua by going to the west or southwest. But this is how it was planned. Um, one of the main group remained uh, to the east of the Llano Estacado, and the detachment of about 100 men uh, advanced to New Mexico. This group was captured on September 17, 1841, and they were marched directly to Mexico City. Uh, Franklin Combs, a 17 year old, who was part of the expedition wrote that they were tied up. They were made to lie in heaps, uh, enclosed in very small spaces. They were, uh, their shoes were taken, their coats, uh, they were tied up and made to walk, uh, being dragged by horses. And sometimes the only food they got was from the women they met on the way. So they received a horrible treatment, uh, this group. Uh, this group made it to Santiago Tlatelolco near the end of December, and they were immediately put in chains. They were placed next to a cemetery, and apparently the, the smell was really bad. They were made to uh, do some hard labor, except for officers and Franklin Combs, the kid who wrote this, uh, because, I mean, he was uh, the son of a Kentucky legislator, so he had, you know, some connections. By this point, the United States started receiving news of their arrest and the treatment that they had been getting. And American citizens started complaining and requesting the United States government, uh, government to intervene. Um, and by this point also, Franklin Combs wrote to the Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs uh, from the US to Mexico, uh, Powhatan Ellis, requesting diplomatic assistance. The Secretary of Legation, Brands Mayer, also intervened, and they met and wrote to uh, Minister of War, uh, Mexican Minister of War, Tornel, and Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, Boca Negra. And they were just doing as much as they could to get at least the American citizens released by that point. Two men escaped. In, the, in this time period, and the security got even worse. Uh, everyone who was not chained was now chained, and they were not uh, being able to receive uh, visits or anything like that. But at, shortly after, Franklin Combs only was released. So back in early November, this is when the bulk of the group uh, got to Paso del Norte. Um, they got a very different treatment, uh, starting with Colonel Jose Maria Elias Gonzalez. Uh, people came out to greet them. Uh, Elias Gonzalez uh, was shocked by Salazar's cruelty and condemned his, his actions. They were housed with the people. They were offered food. They threw a fandango for them. They had beds and tables now to eat. And uh, in, uh, on November 9th, they left Paso del Norte. They were given a uh, horse, uh, wagons, a carriage, uh, the a colonel's personal carriage to transport Navarro and others. Um, they made it to uh, some dunes. This is, uh, it's worth mentioning, it was really cold. So they were walking uh, across the desert, but it was really cold. Yeah. Um, 
they were now again sleeping on the floor like they did you know almost throughout the whole trip but um but now they had blankets and now they had provisions that they were uh were given to them by the uh colonel and the people in Paso del Norte. Lester is there any was there any reason given during your research as to why these two groups were treated so uh differently was it just because who they were captured by? Well, yeah, and I think just the the person in charge, uh, in command of the group was a very big factor. Something I don't understand, for example, is why uh, the first group uh, with Cook, Sutton and Combs was treated so badly uh, all the way to Mexico City. And this group was treated better now at Paso del Norte. Uh, and Salazar, for example, uh, uh, Damaso Salazar, in New Mexico told the, the uh, prisoners that he was really being uh, nice to them by not tying them up, right? And it, it sounded like I had an exaggeration, but then you learn that Combs group was actually tied up. Everyone was tied up in pairs and being dragged by the waist or by the neck with a rope. So it was very, uh, it was way worse how they, they had it. Oh my gosh, that's awful. Oh, and I forgot to mention to everyone um, in the beginning, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type those into the question feature and then we can address those at the end of the presentation. All right, thank you. So um, when they made it to these dunes, uh, they actually had to spend uh, two days at least waiting for the wagons to be dragged by oxen because the sand was so loose that they had to take the wagons in, in with double teams of oxen. So they had to go with uh, all the oxen to pull half of the carts, come back and then uh, pull the rest. Um, and after that, they stopped uh, at some water holes. Uh, at the bottom there of the screen, you can see uh, Presidio de Carrizal says that they were there on the 16th and Ojo Caliente on the 15th. So somehow both Falconer and Kendall got them uh, mixed up. Uh, because uh, on the map, uh, Presidio de Carrizal is before Ojo Caliente. So I thought that was interesting. Um, they stopped at a lake called Encinillas, and then they made it to Chihuahua. Here, the governor uh, came out before they even reached the town to greet them. Uh, multitudes of people greeted them, shook hands with them. They were really nice to them. Uh, they were placed in a cathedral, and Kendall was asked by some American visitors about the death of a certain Kendall and three other men. And he was like, well, uh, I'm alive. And the other three are uh, you know, also here in Chihuahua. Apparently the group that made it to uh, San Miguel first that was, was captured by Salazar, uh, there were rumors that they all died, that they were all executed, but you know, they were there, uh, fortunately. Um, so Kendall also read on a newspaper that uh, governor of New Mexico, Armijo, sent a letter to the governor here in Chihuahua uh, saying, asking him to take uh, special care of Navarro and Kendall and Van Ness because of their intelligence and influence, uh, even though he didn't do the same while they were in New Mexico. So that was kind of weird. He also uh, mentioned that Captain Lewis uh, was instrumental in capturing them. Uh, so it was kind of like a recommendation to the Mexican government, but at the same time, it, uh, it, it was a confession that Lewis pretty much betrayed the, the Texans when, when he was captured. They also um, here were helped by, by uh, uh, Maria Gertrudis uh, Valdez, uh, the wife of uh, Joseph McGoffin, I'm sorry, James McGoffin. Uh, these were the parents of Joseph McGoffin, who actually built and lived in the McGoffin uh, home, uh, which is also a Texas uh, Historical Commission site. Wow, um, what and, an interesting connection. Right. Uh, well, she helped them, apparently, but they uh, she also accepted uh, drafts from them. So they pretty much paid them with uh, credits to be, uh, you know, uh, charged to the Texas government. And when Sam Houston uh, received these drafts, he was completely shocked. And he said, you know, he complained to the legislature that uh, they 
never approved any any of this uh, money to be spent, including I think it was a thousand uh, pesos uh, or dollars that uh, Navarro uh, wrote just in like one draft. Holy so cow! They were I can imagine. Yeah, I can imagine money. how much that would be in like today's money. Right. And yeah. so you, you mentioned in previous webinars that um, uh, President Lamar didn't have, uh, wasn't given permission or, or the Congress didn't agree with him going on this, this expedition. So were any of these things paid for when they asked for money back from the state, even though they initially said they weren't allowing this expedition were they still going to pay like reimburse any of the people on the trip yeah that that's a really good question you know i didn't read anything about that uh because yeah you're completely right it was not authorized by the uh by the legislature but uh i do remember that uh it, it it's said uh i read somewhere that uh lamar forced the treasurer of the republic of texas to finance the expedition so it may have been paid in advance uh, before they, they went on the expedition. Uh, that may have been the case. Okay, so um, November 27, they left Chihuahua. Um, Colonel uh, Ahumada, uh, uh, Antonio Navarro's brother-in-law lived there. He gave them his own personal carriage. Everyone from Chihuahua came out to, uh, to say goodbye to them. Uh, on December 1st, they made it to Saucillo, and right after that, they started planning to escape a bunch of the Texan prisoners. And Navarro told them that they should not try to do that because, uh, not only because of themselves, but also because they could endanger Cook's party uh, that was traveling in advance of them. Um, people didn't want to, uh, some of these uh, Texans didn't want to listen to Navarro, and he ended up just telling the Mexican guards that they were planning to escape. They increased security, and, you know, they kind of resented Navarro there for a little bit. Um, they made it through a few uh, uh, towns after that. Uh, you know, they, uh, the people were really nice. They were given dinner. Um, they made it to Rio Florido. La Noria. In La Noria, they met this uh, woman who was an amazing guitarist, apparently, and threw a fandango for them. At Cerro Gordo, uh, there near the bottom, uh, Ochoa, Captain Ochoa, who was uh, in charge of them since uh, they left Chihuahua, uh, passed the responsibility to Velasco, the new, new captain. Uh, there was another fandango. They were uh, very well treated. Um, on December 13, when they were near La Sarca, um, they, uh, that was the last day that Lamar was president of the Republic of Texas, and uh, he was succeeded by Sam Houston again. Um, they were thrown another fandango in El Gallo, um, and when they made it all the way down to Cuencame, Velasco, uh, turned over the uh, charge to uh, Roblado, an officer called Roblado. Um, December 24th, they man, made it to Estanzuela, uh, it, this tiny town, and they were exhausted. They could not keep walking anymore, and uh, Roblado uh, didn't want to stay anywhere for longer that, than he needed. So he actually asked the mayor, the alcalde, to uh, provide him with donkeys for them uh, to be transported, the, the prisoners. The alcalde was, you know, said that they didn't have that many donkeys. They were like a super small town. And Roblado actually threatened him. Uh, and the next day they had their donkeys, sure enough. So they, they got their donkeys, they kept going, and they spent Christmas uh, they in uh, San Sebastian, where their Christmas dinner was, uh, you know, just like water and beef, uh, roasted beef. Uh, so that's something that Kendall makes uh, a note of. They made it to. Uh -huh. I have one more question. I'm sure. sorry, I keep interrupting. No, but no. so this was President Lamar's initiative, right? From what yes. we've been able to gather throughout this uh, this series, and now he's no longer president. Mm -hmm. So can we assume that Sam Houston was in support of this uh, expedition or not? 
You know, I haven't read uh, about Sam Houston's really reactions other than, than these like secondary sources that talk about, for example, how he was shocked by the uh, spending uh, of the, you know, the expedition. But, uh, you know, the expedition itself, I, I from what I understand, uh, Lamar was pretty much the only one who supported it. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, in terms of the people uh, in power, uh, again, the legislature completely opposed his uh, initiative, and Sam Houston was part of the legislature, so I'm I'm pretty sure he did oppose the expedition. Okay, I see. And can you just we we do have a question coming in, and I do think it's um, pertinent. Sure. Um, this is from Donna. Not clear on what exactly was the purpose of the expedition. I think that's a question we get every single webinar because there's so much information and we really, what was the point of all of this? Um, yeah. Not clear on what exactly was the purpose of the expedition in the first place. Good question. Permission from Mexico to open up a new trade route with Texas? Well, it was, the, I would say the opposite of permission because uh, Texas wanted uh, New Mexico, wanted to uh, get the uh, region east and north of the Rio Grande that was part of New Mexico and make it part of the Republic of Texas. So they, uh, Lamar uh, tried to actually purchase the territory from Mexico, but Mexico didn't even recognize the Republic of Texas as an independent nation, right? Uh, they were considered as uh, invaders uh, to a degree. So without being able to annex this region, Lamar sent the expedition to either establish trade with Santa Fe or to take over the government. Um, but, it, you know, the, the trade uh, excuse, the more I look at it, uh, the less sense it makes, because as you saw in the, uh, on the first map there, uh, they had to actually travel north north and then west when they were trying to trade with Mexico. But uh, a couple of sources at least mentioned that Santa Fe, there was nothing in Santa Fe. Like the real trade was done in Chihuahua and Santa Fe was just kind of a stopping point from uh, St. Louis uh, or Independence, I'm sorry, Missouri to, uh, to Chihuahua. So it was just a stopping point, Santa Fe. So it was kind of, it's kind of, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense if he really just wanted to establish trade. It was um, more than likely uh, an operation to try to take over the government. And also uh, Lamar was uh, being told, was told that people in Santa Fe supported him and that they would welcome the Texans. Okay, so, so, so that could, maybe if he could acquire this land, maybe it would make uh the republic give the republic more legitimacy maybe being larger having more support of people yeah yeah and lamar was an expansionist he during his inaugural address he said he wanted to the, uh, the republic of texas to extend from the sabine river all the way to the pacific ocean so this was you know just a step in the direction really mm. okay um so they made it to fresnillo zacatecas uh, after some tiresome marches, they spent only one night there, uh, even though they wanted to stay longer. And that Calera, right outside of Fresnillo, uh, one of the men uh, started exhibiting uh, smallpox symptoms. They made it to Zacatecas. Here, again, uh, a lot of people came out to greet them. Uh, it's a beautiful city, but they were put in two moldy rooms, as they are described. Uh, people, uh, you know, the men started coughing. They had, uh, it was really cold, uh, but they were allowed to roam free. They visited a restaurant, a tailor, churches. They were actually invited to a New Year's ball, but when they were uh, making plans to go, Minister of War Tornel uh, directed the Mexican authorities to put, especially Navarro and uh, certain Robert Foster under close watch uh, because they were, you know, they were just uh, uh, singled out basically uh, because of their role in the, uh, in the expedition. And Robert Foster, there was no one by that name. So they actually uh, mistook Falconer, Thomas Falconer for this person. And he was put under close watch uh, 
by the Mexican authorities. Still, um, a dollar was given to each man. Um, it's, I mean, it's kind of ambiguous. Uh, Falconer writes just, you know, that uh, that as part of how they were being treated well in general, but uh, it may have also been possible that foreigners in Zacatecas may have contributed to that. I'm not really sure. Um, they were given six horses for the officers, two wagons for the sick, and they would take an indirect uh, route. Cook was taken directly. Uh, Cook, Sutton, and Combs were taken all directly to Mexico City. But this group would be sent through um, Guanajuato uh, just to allow more people to see the Texas prisoners. The Texan prisoners. They left Zacatecas. They made it to San Luis Potosí. Here, really, the only uh, noteworthy uh, stop was Espiritu Santo Hacienda. They had supper, music, and dance. Um, they made it to San Luis Potosí in early January. Uh, everyone, at least, uh, again, uh, multitudes of people came up to, to greet them. Uh, they were paraded to a monastery. It was, uh, Kendall describes this city as being one of the best built. They were um, actually allowed to remain. Six of them, six or, or seven Texans were able to remain in uh, San Luis Potosí to be treated for smallpox. And here also foreigners uh, provided them with clothing and money. And Kendall and some officers were allowed to roam free. Um, Roblado, the the captain left them there and they got a new guard. And here it's very interesting because this guard was at the Battle of San Jacinto and he was wounded and he was housed with a, with a Texan person, right? And this Texan man treated him very well, tended to his wounds, fed him. And it turns out that this Texan uh, man who took care of him was part of the, this uh, group of the Santa Fe expedition. So they were reunited, right? And they, they had uh, apparently a very uh, nice reunion uh, that uh, uh, words can't describe or something like that. Uh, wow. These yeah. people, they lived a life. Yeah, they did. Uh, so they made it through a couple more towns. Uh, when they made it to San Juan de los Llanos Hacienda, a lot of them apparently started exhibiting small, smallpox symptoms. Um, they made it to Silao, and then uh, the next day they made it to Guanajuato. Um, they were uh, housed in the barracks. Um, the foreigners, again, were uh, very kind to them, contributed with uh, clothing and money. Um, Eighteen of them now had to stay in, in Guanajuato, but this was kind of a, you know, really just a good action by the Mexican authorities because... You know, there was really no instruction for them to allow them to remain in the cities. cities. So it was, uh, you know, in part also the Mexican uh, authorities and the guard that, you know, was allowing them to stay to be treated for, for smallpox. Five people died. Uh, one of the uh, men who uh, came down, you know, with smallpox, who was sick, was Captain Caldwell. Uh, and he was allowed to remain there. Guanajuato. Ten dollars were given to officers and merchants. One dollar was uh, given to the rest of the men. Shoes and shirts also were provided here in Guanajuato. Um, they made it to Salamanca, apparently a beautiful city with uh, churches and universities, uh, then to Celaya. And uh, here they were allowed to roam free also. They visited uh, convent churches and Curtis Caldwell. Uh, Captain Matthew Caldwell's son, who was 14 years old, uh, also got sick with smallpox, and he was allowed to remain there uh, in Celaya, uh, in the governor's house, actually. And he was later sent back to Guanajuato with his father. Um, they made it to Querétaro. Um, it was uh, also, he describes it as a beautiful city, Kendall specifically. Um, they were housed at an uh, old convent, which, uh, you know, in the complete opposite fashion, he describes as a dismal hole at best. Uh, here, I think it's very interesting that uh, food vendors approached them and Falconer bought like one orange or something like that and paid with a whole dollar. 
and instead of be, uh, being given like coin currency like we are used to now uh, apparently they were given soap a soap with a stamp and that was kind of like their their change you know uh that was their currency oh my god and then this is probably this currency is probably only valid in that town and then you need to move on to the next town where you have no money now yeah yeah exactly yeah uh so they were allowed to roam through the city and they followed uh, the next day the uh aqueduct you can see actually a picture of them of, of the aqueduct there ascended the mountain and here they heard about the escape uh that happened in Santiago Tlatelolco that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so by the time uh, it was January 27, they were about around San Juan del Rio, they heard that Combs was, was set free. And as an American citizen, Kendall was also hoping that he would be released soon, right? That was pretty much one of the main reasons why he was, uh, why Combs was released. Um, they uh, stopped through uh, at a couple small villages, and uh, they two of them attempted to escape, but they were recaptured and they were immediately sent to one of the worst prisons called La Cordada uh, in Mexico City. They were right very close by them uh, at Cuautitlan or near Cuautitlan. Uh, Navarro is uh, separated from the group and sent directly to Mexico City, apparently to San Lazaro, uh, convent and church of San Lazaro. And the rest of the group was taken to a small uh, palace in San Cristobal. Uh, I believe it's uh, San Cristobal de Ecatepec, where uh, 20 men were now sick with smallpox. And uh, Lomsten, who was the co-founder of the Picayune, newspaper in New Orleans with along with Kendall visited him there. Okay, so here um, we have a few, uh, you know, a lot of people in different places. So I kind of like try to just track them, uh, track where they were at that point. So six or seven stayed at San Luis Potosí, 19 at Guanajuato, two were sent to La Acordada. Uh, uh, the, and by this point, February 9 or so, um, Kendall was uh, sent from San Cristobal to San Lazaro also. Uh, Falconer had also been released. Uh, and well, when uh, Kendall was uh, sent to San Lazaro, uh, you know, or before that, they were given money. Uh, the foreigners were really nice to them also. Uh, and he was part of the people who were um, deemed unfit to travel, uh, about uh, 20 of them, I think I mentioned, and, uh, or 18. Uh, and they were actually transported by donkeys to, to Mexico City. So this group of six people from San Cristobal was sent to San Lazaro. Uh, and then the healthier men were sent to either Puebla, 70 were sent there, and 52 to Perote, and about 90. Uh, were in Cook, Sutton uh, party, uh, you know, now without comps. Uh, uh, they were in Santiago Tlatelolco. So uh, all these together would have been around 258 men out of 320 who left Austin. So by this point, you know, at least, you know, 60 people or so uh, were didn't make it this far. Um, but I'll talk about this a little more later. Um, so um, by this point, again, this is a map of Mexico City. Uh, San Lazaro is where Kendall and the men with small, smallpox were sent. Tlatelolco is where Cook and the other uh, 90 or so men uh, were uh, imprisoned. And Navarro, with the other two men who tried to escape, with, were at La Acordada. So uh, Minister of War Tornel turned to uh, Commandant General of Mexico City, Andrade, uh, the case of Navarro, and he uh, directed it to prosecutor uh, uh, Mariano Morlet. And their, the instruction was to charge Navarro with treason. So they, they were given documents and letters to kind of support the, 
the case, uh, Morlet, the prosecutor, immediately went to Tlatelolco to gather uh, uh, the accounts of, by, uh, of, of different Texan prisoners. At La Cordada, uh, then Morlet also, you know, after visiting them at Santiago Tlatelolco, Morlet visited Navarro directly at La Cordada. Um, there, Navarro said that he was just a delegate, that he wasn't really, you know, a big part of the Texas independence movement. Uh, he said that he did not participate at San Jacinto because apparently there was a Navarro there. They thought that Jos Antonio Navarro, you know, was part of the army. He denied that claim. Uh, he said that he never thought about leaving Texas because, you know, that was his, uh, his home. So, um, and that Lamar, uh, the president of the Republic, had to personally travel to San Antonio to try to convince him. Uh, on top of that, he mentioned that Armijo made a promise that nobody would be killed if they surrendered peacefully, and that McLeod, the uh, um, military commander of the expedition, uh, had that in, in writing, right? So Navarro made a few points to the defend his position and, you know, trying to not be sentenced to death for treason. Um, so this is uh, Kendall at San Lazaro. Uh, Falconer visited him before leaving uh, to, you know, back to the United States and later to England. Um, five of the men in San Lazaro were sent to Tlatelolco, leaving only seven at San Lazaro. Uh, Minister Ellis, Minister of the U.S. to Mexico, Powhatan Ellis, talked to Santana about, you know, uh, releasing the American uh, prisoners because at least Kendall wasn't at all part of the expedition. He joined just to document the trip and, you know, uh, he had a, an American passport. But Santana said that Combs, Franklin Combs, who had already been released, uh, was actually leading an invasion of Mexico. So it was, it's really weird because that was kind of his uh, reasoning of uh, why not to release the, the rest of the American uh, prisoners. And also uh, Santana uh, wanted an explanation of why there were uh, United States warships uh, near the coast of Veracruz. The uh, Secretary of Legation Mayor uh, told uh, Kendall that he was likely to be released soon. And uh, when he talked to Bocanegra, he pretty much repeated the same comes invasion, uh, comes invasion, the warships, and that the United States papers were very critical of Mexico. Uh, and, you know, Meyer said, well, comes is already home. Like, we, he wasn't really part of any sort of invasion at all. Uh, the, warship, the warships had already left uh, the Veracruz area. And we don't control the newspaper. That they're completely independent, right? <laughs> well, were the warships were they American or were they Texan? Uh, uh, well, you know they were out answering for uh, American warships. Oh. There was a blockade uh, at you know around that time, uh, and that was one of uh, Santana's reasons also to kind of keep them imprisoned, but. Uh, you know, that was like a, its own thing. I, I think they were talking specifically about U.S. warships at this point. So one man got sick uh, from Tlatelolco and he was sent to San Lazaro. Uh, Howard, uh, a major Howard escaped from Puebla uh, along with another man, uh, a, fr a French uh, man, actually, I think he was. Uh, Thompson was the new minister of the U.S. to Mexico, Wadi Thompson. He visited Kendall, and he told them now that it was unlikely for uh, them to be able to set him free. Uh, Kendall, at this point, uh, after Thompson asked about Kendall, Kendall was sent to Tlatelolco, even though he wanted to stay in San Lázaro. Um, and Kendall was uh, fettered. Um, he was, uh, you know, chained, putting chains, but uh, they actually bribed the blacksmith so that they wouldn't, uh, you know, they, they wouldn't fetter, they wouldn't be fettered uh, that tightly, right? So they were actually able to remove the chains uh, when they were <laughs> being seen. Um, Thompson again inquired about Kendall. 
to Boca Negra. And, uh, you know, again, this was within a couple of days. And then on the 21st, the anniversary of uh, the Battle of San Jacinto, already being celebrated by that point, uh, the Texan prisoners kind of convinced the uh, Mexican guards to allow them to celebrate the patron Satan of Texas. Uh, so they actually painted an American flag and, you know, they had uh, songs and everything. Uh, and uh, they actually celebrated San Jacinto Day there in Santiago Tlatelolco. And he, uh, Kendall was told that he was likely to be released. Um, can, uh, the same day or the next day, uh, the Secretary of Legation and the now uh, former minister, uh, Ellis visited Kendall again at Latelolco and they actually left with him. He was released. Uh, he was housed in a place called Gran Sociedad, a beautiful building. Uh, Kendall immediately after being released visiting the, uh, visited the British minister uh, to tell him about the bad treatment of the British uh, nationals there. Um, and Kendall also visited the people at San Lazaro and Tlatelolco uh, to gifts for them, uh, talked to, talk to them, took messages. He actually met with Major Howard who had escaped and was in disguise. Uh, three more men were released on April 27th. And uh, then Kendall visited Navarro at La Cordada. He wrote that he was in horrible condition. He was unshaven. He was, uh, his clothes were dirty. Uh, he was afraid. Uh, he was given very little food, you know, just like beans and rice, I think, or beans and a tortilla. Uh, so Navarro seemed desperate at that point. Uh, and he just, you know, kind of begged him to uh, tell his family that he was okay, that he was hoping to be released at some point. And Kendall actually uh, slipped some money to him uh, while he was shaking his hand uh, before leaving. And Kendall also saw other uh, prisoners, at the, other members of the Santa Fe expedition at La Cordada visiting other people who had been uh, arrested, especially, uh, specifically a couple from uh, arrested in Matamoros. So after that, uh, Kendall leaves to the uh, Mexico City, leaves Mexico City. He meets the uh, people at Puebla, the prisoners at Puebla and at Perote. They were treated very poorly, even though uh, Perote, they weren't treated that badly, as badly as Puebla, at least, or, uh, yeah, and Tlatelolco, they weren't treated that badly either. You know, they bribed the, uh, the blacksmith and they were doing very little work, really. Um, so, but he was, uh, he had the intention to sail back to New Orleans. Um, he traveled with, uh, uh, Minister Ellis, and they learned that there was an outbreak of yellow fever in Veracruz, and they had to stay in Calapa for about 10 days, uh, but eventually they made it to Veracruz. They sailed to, uh, from uh, Veracruz to New Orleans uh, in May, and that's when they got there. And uh, back to Navarro, uh, on May 18, 1842, the prosecutor and the defense attorney presented final arguments. Uh, Morlet said that, uh, you know, he was uh, guilty of treason, that he signed the constitution, that other Tejanos had left Texas. So there was no excuse for him to have uh, sided with the Texans, but that he was a prisoner of war and that Armijo made a promise not to kill anyone. So he did not recommend the death penalty. Santana was extremely angry. And just at that moment, he fired Morlet and he appointed a new prosecutor, uh, Manuel Manilla Iturria. Then the defense attorney uh, based his defense on um, a case of, well, uh, Spanish citizens who collaborated with jo uh, Joseph Bonaparte. Uh, you know, because the Spanish government uh, government couldn't uh, give them any uh, any benefits, or you know, they, they the Spanish government couldn't help them at all. 
So they were not to be held guilty for having collaborated with uh, with this French uh, appointee, right? And uh, also he said that Lamar uh, traveled to San Antonio and uh, Armijo also, uh, you know, promised not to kill anyone. The, this mil military tribunal decided unanimously to sentence Navarro to death. Uh, and then a legal advisor, uh, when he got the sentence, he actually uh, recommended uh, uh, Andrade to reject the sentence. Just based on the simple fact that Morlet didn't recommend the death penalty. So Andrade, instead of making that decision himself, he's turned the case over to the military su Supreme Court. On June 13, the men who were not released on April, uh, in April, uh, were actually released by Santana on the day of his saint, Saint Anthony. Apparently, more than 30,000 people were there, and the Texans were treated very kindly by, by the people there in the parade. Uh, they made it to Veracruz around August, and uh, about 45 of them had yellow fever. Uh, some of them who died from yellow fever were buried uh, between Calapa and Veracruz in a place called Puente Nacional. Uh, Tornelas Andrade about the uh, you know the decision uh, if the military supreme court had decided anything, and it wasn't until September 24 that they decided to uh, uh, reject the sentence by the military tribunal and instead to allow Navarro to live. You know, they could uh, punish him with a life sentence or anything, but they could not uh, sentence him to death um, because of Armito's promise, because he was a prisoner of war, and they actually recommended him to be placed in a healthy place. Uh, Santana considered this to be a slap in the face, and he, with Tornel, uh, reprimanded Andrade, uh, the commandant general who turned the case over to the military Supreme Court and directed him to fire Sosaya, the legal advisor, and dismiss the whole military Supreme Court uh, because they recognized basically indirectly Texas as a nation. Well, this, this was kind of Santa Ana's like how he operated, right? Anyone who went against what he wanted or his opinions he would try and fire them or get someone else, bring someone else in to make the decision he was wanting, that kind of, well, he was a dictator, right? Duh. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but I mean, it's, it's, it's still unbelievable. You know, he dismissed the whole military Supreme Court uh, because, again, mostly because uh, they indirectly recognized Texas as a nation, but not only did he dismiss them, but he has to be put, uh, to put all the justices on trial themselves. So that was, you know, just even worse, right? Um, another legal advisor was appointed. Uh, his name was De La Pesa. And after, you know, months of studying the case, he actually upheld, upheld the decision by the military Supreme Court uh, that Navarro could not be sentenced to death and that by no circumstance should the justices be placed under trial for fire or dismissed for that uh, for that reason, right? So uh, in October 1843, so this is a year basically after his uh, the mil military Supreme Court's decision, uh, he's uh, decided it's decided that he would be sent to San Juan de Lua, a fortress who that was considered even worse than La Cordada, worse than La Cordada. Uh, he sent a bunch of letters to Santana, but, you know, he didn't, of course, he didn't listen. And uh, he was, Navarro was sent to Veracruz on October 14. He was to be placed in isolation and he was very afraid of his, uh, of the other inmates. Uh, military commander of the Santa Fe expedition, uh, McLeod, back in Texas already contacted British diplomats to intervene uh, on behalf of Navarro in Mexico. On February 1st, 1844, George Van Ness was able to visit Navarro, even though he wasn't supposed to receive any visits, and he found them afraid 
And even though the Mexican uh, officers were not isolating him, he was self-isolated because he was afraid of pretty much everyone. It is uh, said that he that Navarro was attached to a ring on the floor, uh, chained to a ring on the floor, and that because of that ring, uh, that ring actually shows now in his cattle brand. Or after he came back to Texas, there's a story that you know that we hear. Also, uh, another story that Santana was at the fortress uh, at San Juan de Lua expecting an apology from, for, uh, from Navarro. Navarro simply refused because uh, he didn't want to um, give him the satisfaction, right? Um, Tornel uh, was uh, left his position as uh, Minister of War, and the new Minister of War was Jose Isidro Reyes. He reprimanded the officials because apparently Navarro was allowed to roam free around San Juan de Lua. He wasn't, you know, he was not, <laughs> he was not being uh, put in under such a heavy guard as, as they wanted, as they were directed to. They replied that, you know, well, it, there was some uh, truth to it, but that now he was next to the, he was placed next to the guardhouse. So they would keep a close eye on him. So at some in this in between time, he was able to roam freely in and out of the prison. Apparently, apparently, I mean, it doesn't say. Uh, I didn't read the in and out of the prison at that point, mm -hmm. but you know, he was basically, you know, he sleep he slept apparently in the officers' quarters, and he was, you know, just allowed out of, out of his cell when he was supposed to be in isolation. Uh, they also complained that he. He would, you know, just talk about Santana, you know, very badly. So that was another complaint that uh, Reyes uh, sent to the, forwarded to the officials. They denied this, right? But, uh, but they did that. There was some truth to the fact that he was uh, being given, uh, given lax treatment. Um, so Santana, uh, at this point, lost support in Mexico. Uh, apparently his wife died and he remarried. His wife was extremely popular and he remarried within days to a 14-year-old girl. And uh, this apparently was a really bad move. And just in general, he was just losing uh, support. And um, shortly after he lost the presidency, uh, the new president was Jose Joaquin de Herrera. Uh, attorney Luis Maria Aguilar was hired by, most likely, uh, by the British uh, government, or at least had a, the British government had some uh, role uh, to, in, the, in the hiring of this uh, attorney. And he and Navarro started writing petitions to uh, Herrera, to the new Mexican president, uh, you know, saying how he was uh, basically, uh, you know, abused and how he was uh, given uh, treatment that even the military Supreme Court said he shouldn't be given, right? Um, and on January 27, uh, Herrera ordered the release of Navarro. Uh, and by the time they uh, went to notify Navarro that he was going to be released, Navarro was nowhere to be found. Apparently, uh, he was now allowed by the officers to roam free around the town, around uh, in Veracruz. And some friends helped him get on a ship and he sailed from Veracruz to uh, Havana, Cuba in uh, mid-January. Uh, then he, that same day, uh, he sailed to New Orleans. He spent about a week or so there, uh, Cook, was there, Kendall was there. Kendall apparently housed him in a really nice hotel. Uh, he was given medical attention. And then shortly after, uh, he sailed to Galveston, Texas, where he describes uh, as being the best day of his life, the, the happiest day of his life. And uh, he was received as a hero. Wow. Well, so, Lester, how, how long was it from the beginning of the expedition? I know it was in June, mm -hmm. but then how long till Navarro returned home? How many? That was years. Yeah, no, it was years. Uh, they left uh, around, 
June 21st, 1841. And he came back in, uh, you know, late January, almost February of 1845. Wow. Yeah. So um, here are my sources. Uh, if you have any questions or suggestions, there's my email there at the bottom. I think we're uh, also open for questions right now. If you have any questions. Yes, we have one more question. Mm -hmm. um, this is from Donna as well. Um, there seems to have been a lot of ambivalence and questionable loyalty on both sides. What were the likely motivations? That's a very complex question. I mean, I, I, I think it's like they, they had just different uh, reasons. Uh, I, I don't know uh, what you may be uh, talking about necessarily, but uh, like just the one that comes to my mind uh, is uh, Lewis, right? Uh, Captain Lewis, he was captured uh, in an advance party uh, where Kendall was, only five men were sent. And uh, Lewis had lived in Chihuahua for years. So he was the translator, he knew Spanish very well, and he sided with the, with the New Mexican government. Uh, I think just for pure self-preservation, uh, you know, just he didn't want to be associated with the Texans who, you know, obviously were uh, now being captured and they were, uh, you know, at the mercy of, of the New Mexico authorities. Um, just to add to that, though, um, Captain Lewis, after this, after his recommendation by Armijo to the governor of Chihuahua, uh, he comes back to uh, Chihuahua. Uh, and he wants to, you know, like just keep living there with his uh, friends that he had already at the time. And he was met with uh, a lot of uh, rejection. Mm -hmm. uh, he was rejected by everyone in Chihuahua. He ended up traveling to Guaymas. Uh, nobody wanted him there either. And apparently, I mean, he wherever he went, he was rejected. This is what I, I read. Kendall wrote this specifically. But he eventually had to sail out to the Sandwich Islands. And apparently, you know, he just assumed a new identity because, you know, he nobody wanted to be associated with him. Man, nobody had heard of him out there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we have one more question. What is the best book to read on this subject? Kendall. Kendall, for sure. It's two volumes. Uh, oh. They're like about maybe a, a little less than 400 pages each. But it's just uh you know descriptions by kendall are just uh you know i don't know there is, people don't write that way i don't think you know today uh this is like a very detailed and uh you know be, just beyond that he is basically considered an authority by uh a few secondary sources that i read uh, they all base, a, you know, some information at least uh, on on Kendall's writing. Okay, so is that that would be the second to last bullet point you have listed here? The narrative of the Texan Santa Fe expedition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, if you need the exact title or anything, let me know. They are also uh, in the public domain, so you can get them. Uh, you can download the PDF from a bunch of different places. Cool. Well, I think that's all the questions we have. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to Lester for the research on this three-part series. It was a juicy one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.